Uh, thanks for the organizers for uh, asking me to come and talk about our recent work. My name is John. I'm a uh, postdoc at UCLA. Um, but also some of this work was done um, while I was at Harvard. Okay, don't need it. Um, all right, so I'll start again by thanking my collaborators, uh, especially Marios, who is in the audience and I believe will be next. And I uh, apologize for taking some of your time. And um, Eugene, who is also in the audience, um, who we uh, work closely with. And our uh, paper on this is now out, actually appeared yesterday. So <laughs> I got this for you uh, late last minute. Um, okay, so we've heard a lot about optics, so I think I am allowed to do a brief introduction, but nonetheless. Uh, so optics we've been using to study material since essentially the Stone Age. Um, you know, maybe the most, uh, the first example we learn is about birefringence in crystals and how this reflects the symmetry class of the crystal. Uh, if you have a, you know, an index of refraction that's not the same in all directions or for all polarizations, then you have a reduced symmetry in that system, and this gives you this weird double double refraction. Um, we also have a little bit more sophisticated cases, for instance, using um, curve, uh, reflected curve rotation angle to detect time reversal symmetry breaking in, for instance, superconductors. Optical conductivity tells us a great deal about the excitation spectrum in the system. There are a little bit more exotic things, such as near-field optics, where you can get you know, optical resolution below the diffraction limit. Pump probe spectroscopy, which we heard a lot about recently. Um, is sort of fantastic for exploring dynamics and non-equilibrium aspects of systems, classical quantum. Um, and just to get situated, so since this is a, a diverse audience, I will give you a brief introduction of where this talk will sit. Um, basically, you can think about things in terms of energy scales or time scales or temperature scales. Um, and I will start, you know, we can start at gigahertz as a condensed matter theorist. That's sort of the lowest that we often go, but uh, you know, cold atoms and et cetera is a different story. But we have things like ferromagnetic resonance at low frequencies, actually your microwave oven, uh, which you use to heat up broccoli, for instance, can be um, you know, a few gigahertz. Uh, so that's sort of deep in the microwave regime. Actually, base temperature of dilution refrigerators is around there. You have, now we start to get into sort of quantum materials, TC of you know, magic angle bilayer graphene, um, actually the cosmic microwave background radiation, so that's sort of the ambient temperature of the universe, um, liquid helium, four, you know, useful for refrigerants. Actually, now we start to get to sort of, um, you know, a little, well, nickel oxide um, is a common material, but anti-ferromagnetic behavior, so you have uh, AFMR, which is at higher frequencies, approaching terahertz, you have TCs for these high temperature cuprates, et cetera, et cetera, room temperature, you know, phonon modes and materials, for instance, in HBN. So now this is actual structural vibrations of the system. Uh, then the surface of the sun, actually that's not quite so hot. Um, you know, semiconducting band gaps, plasma frequencies of metals, and if you go here this year, you can have a Nobel Prize, although um, I think you got a little bit beaten to the chase. Uh, and so what, I, what we'll be talking about today is over here, this collective quantum effects, where it's really sort of the you know, collective motion of a bunch of spins or the collective motions of a bunch of ions in a crystal, but it still has a significant aspect of quantum, uh, you know, quantum mechanics, for instance, you know, high TC superconductivity. Um, and it's typically in the terahertz regime. Um, now, I said we can use optics to study materials, but actually we can also use it to control materials. And, We've seen a lot of this at this workshop, so I won't list everyone who's presented it, you know, in the lab before me, but just to give a handful of examples, um, actually you can use the helicity of light, for instance, to control antiferromagnetic order in certain uh, interesting topological phases. Um, you can try to control uh, inversion symmetry breaking in a ferroelectric system by pumping the vibrations of the lattice. Of course, light-induced superconductivity is um, very popular very complicated, um, but trying to sort of induce superconductivity in a material where it's either at a temperature above TC or it's not in the ambient phase but at pressure, um, you know, trying to re you know, restore superconducting behavior. Of course, if you can push this up to ambient conditions and room temperature, 
then you can have a billion dollars, but it's not easy, we've heard. Um, and one of the problems with that is actually very simple, it's simply that heating. So if you try to control things with strong light fields, then you are injecting energy into a system, and if you inject too much energy into a system, then it's hard to maintain quantum co coherence, and in fact, you may actually even just burn the sample completely. Um, and so, is there a way that we can actually still use light fields to control or manipulate phases of matter, but try to circumvent the dumping of energy into these fragile systems? And uh, what I will try to explain to you today is that actually cavities and resonant uh, manipulation of fluctuations can offer a way out. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a cop-out, but it works. Um, so here we have a situation where we apply strong driving to manipulate something, but you know, if you're applying energy, you're leaving thermal equilibrium, you're dumping power into the system. But uh, as we've seen successfully demonstrated uh, for decades in, in AMO systems, if you instead sort of just tune the ambient nature of fluctuations, even in thermal equilibrium, you can still change the physics. You know, you're actually not changing the temperature, you're not changing, you're not applying any power, you're just redistributing its thermal, um, you know, how it's allocated by thermal occupation. Uh, so this is sort of illustrated here. Uh, photons in a fabric perot type cavity can interact with the system, and if you change this from the vacuum black body fluctuations, then you may be able to tune the properties of the material enclosed. And as I sort of alluded to, this is actually quite an old idea. So it goes back to one of uh, you know, famous people uh, not so far away, um, Purcell. So even in the 40s, uh, it was found that actually you can use a cavity to control the radiative lifetime of certain excitations in a system. And so this tells you, you know, we sort of learn oh, line widths of an atomic transition. This is just a fact of nature, but it actually isn't. It depends on what you put, you know, that atomic uh, transition in. If you surround it with a cavity by changing the density of states of your bath, you can actually change the rate at which it decays into the vacuum. So this already tells us that, you know, this is not an immutable fact of nature. And also around the same time, it was pointed out that uh, by Casimir that actually vacuum fluctuations of the quantum electrodynamic field can do actual work on systems. In this case, it was shown that if you have two, the sort of famous Casimir effect is about mirrors in a vacuum and they experience an attractive force. And roughly you can understand this as you place your mirrors in a vacuum, but because the electromagnetic vacuum is always fluctuating, uh, you have more fluctuations outside than you have in, inside the cavity. And if you allow these to move, they will be sort of pressed together by the imbalance in the vacuum fluctuations. So this tells us, you know, actually the boundary conditions that the mirrors are enforcing on our system experience a change in the energy density, and this can actually do work on the system in sort of thermodynamic sense. And then that, that kind of raises this question, can we use the same sort of effect of the work of the vacuum to change the material properties? I guess that maybe sounds a little bit um, exotic, but I hope to convince you it's actually rather straightforward. So here's the original problem we had. We had vacuum, 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 and we impose boundary conditions, and we look at the energy as a function of the distance between these boundary conditions, and we minimize that energy, and this pulls them together. We can instead turn this problem around on its head. We take a dielectric medium here. It's sort of a crystal with an uh, index of refraction, so it's some, some color. We put boundary conditions on it, and you can, instead of allowing the walls of the cavity to move, you fix them in place, and it instead does the work on the material in, in between the two cavities. So this, of course, requires that, for instance, the dielectric medium between the two cavities actually is you know, self-consistently determined, so there has to be some nonlinear physics going on. If it's just a material property, you can't do much, but nothing is just a material property. Okay, so our work aims to demonstrate this on a sort of a test, simple test case, which is this quantum paraelectric material. So you can think for sort of, if you're more of an explicit type of person, uh, an example of this quantum paraelectric could be strontium titanate, which is this perovskite insulating material. It has some crystal structure with oxygens and strontium. And if, for instance, you change the mass of the oxygen nuclei by isotopic substitution, or you apply pressure or strain, uh, you can sort of cross over from this paraelectric phase into a ferroelectric phase. 
So just as a you know, paramagnet is sort of magnetically susceptible, but is not magnetized, a paraelectric is, para is electrically sub uh, susceptible, but not electrotized. Um, and intrinsically, this uh, strontium titanate is this quantum paraelectric, but it seems to be quite close to a critical point. So you know, it, it's very mutable in some sense. You can think you have, what actually is, is you have a certain phonon mode associated to the vibrations of the strontium, or the, of the titanium in the, in the center of this octahedral oxygen cage, and it undergoes quantum vibrations or thermal vibrations, and these are very fast. But as you approach the critical point, they sort of undergo this critical slowing down, and the phonon frequency goes to zero. And once it goes to zero, you sort of freeze in this phonon mode, and it becomes a polar distortion. So we're right on the cusp of this point. And this is just signified here. If you look at the inverse dielectric constant, it seems to diverge at low temperatures. Well, the dielectric constant seems to diverge at low temperatures, uh, signifying a really strong coupling between electric fields and polarization, which is due to this phonon. And actually, at very low temperatures, it caps off. It's believed to be due to quantum fluctuations of the lattice itself. But there's a lot of argument about this still. And so we're going to take this sort of material with these fluctuating phonon modes and put it between two cavity walls and see if we manipulate these boundary conditions, can we change the way that these dipolar moments fluctuate. Um, so this is really, all, you can think of it as almost like a many body quantum optics problem where each of these is a little quantum uh, emitter and we arrange them a bunch you know, in between cavities and then this is not so different from you know, an AMO uh, neutral atom system, but these are sort of fixed in place by the lattice. Um, okay, so how do we describe the effect on this phonons? Well, we have a certain uh, order parameter, let's say, which characterizes this distortion. You can call it Q, and for each point in space, you have a Q and each point in time. So this is your Ginzburg-Landau order parameter. And you can write down some free energy and sort of by symmetry grounds, it has to go like a quadratic piece with some phonon frequency plus a nonlinear part, and this is crucial, again, to actually being a mutable medium. If that's not there, then you can't change much. And this is the sort of the soft mode frequency. Actually, this has to be renormalized, so it's not exactly the soft mode frequency. Um, and then there's this anharmonic coupling. And then we have to include the effect of electromagnetic fluctuations. We do this by adding Maxwell equations. So we have in Matsubara formalism, uh, and I apologize, I'm a theorist, so. Okay, good, good, good. Um, <laughs> you have electric field, which is basically the imaginary time derivative of your gauge field, and you know this is sort of non-commuting with your magnetic field, hence the time derivative. And you have the magnetic induction energy, and this just gives you Maxwell's equations in imaginary time. And finally, there's a dipolar coupling. So this has a dipole moment, and this couples directly to the electric field, which is time derivative of the gauge potential, with some uh, light matter coupling strength eta. Okay, so we have this complicated field theory. What do we do? Well, we essentially, you can do Hartree-Fock on this nonlinearity here. You can do a couple mathematical steps. I'll spare you the details. The point is that you end up with a simplified theory, which involves this renormalized phonon stiffness, which includes not only the bare material contribution, but also contributions from the fluctuations. And it involves the dielectric medium of your photons, which receives by sort of this uh, uh, Mathematic this canonical transformation involves the TO mode frequency. So this includes uh, basically this parameter enters into here and it governs the uh, fluctuations of your photons in the system. And then you can minimize this uh, sort of variational onsets. What is the best self consistently determined phonon frequency, including the contribution from all fluctuations, including especially photon fluctuations? That's just to say that there's a contribution to the free energy due to the vacuum fluctuations in this variable dielectric, and you minimize, essentially find what is the dielectric. What's important is because of this magnetic induction term, it's actually sensitive, it's a non-local effect. It's sensitive to boundary conditions. This is just saying phot photons have dispersion, and if you put a, you know, a mirror, then they will bounce off the mirror, and you will suppress you know, electric field fluctuations near the mirror. If you do this mathematical procedure, just minimize, you get some formula that looks like this. So basically, this tells you the shift in the soft mode frequency with respect to essentially the infinite cavity limit. So as I said, you have to renormalize away some counter terms and you compare you know, infinitely large cavity to a finitely large cavity. That gives you this subtraction here. 
and then you sum over frequencies, you sum over all modes in the system. What you would expect is that in bulk you can say electro electric field fluctuations are essentially homogeneous, just translational invariance. But once you put boundary conditions, they will sort of be suppressed near the mirrors. You have a constraint on tangential electric field that suppresses them, and so you have less electric field fluctuations near the edges. And if you work this out in the fully multi-mode scenario, which is what we've now done, so including in-plane momentum, including all transverse modes of the cavity, uh, then you can sort of diagnose this at each point in space as a function of depth through the cavity. Uh, so I'll just quickly flash these results. Um, so basically what this is interrogating is the change in the frequency at the midpoint of the cavity as a function of the length of the cavity. So we start out with a large cavity and we see that there's not much change, but as we make it shorter and shorter, this mode actually in the middle starts to blue shift. Uh, and this is at fixed temperature. And this is just, um, this can actually be sort of easily understood by looking at it not just in the middle, but actually as a function of position through the cavity. So we start at the midpoint, and then we look at this sort of frequency shift all the way up to the edge. We see it basically has no shift in the middle, but then as you get to the edge, exactly where this electric field starts to be suppressed by the boundary, the mode blue shifts and it becomes um, you know, slightly less soft. And it actually also as a function of temperature, increases at lower temperatures. That's just to say that this is due to actually quantum fluctuations, not any sort of classical effect. It basically has a one over T correction at high temperature. Okay, I'll finish by saying that actually um, there's some interesting connections to an old puzzle. Um, perhaps puzzle in strontium titanate thin films. People wanted to make these into ultra small capacitors because of this large dielectric constant. It was thought that you could make a very efficient capacitor at very small scale. So they made very thin films and actually they saw that the dielectric constant unsoftened when they made it smaller and smaller. And this uh, basically signifies that the mode unsoftens as you make it uh, into a thin film. Now, I don't know if this is fully conclusively resolved or anyone how much people cared. I think most of it was perhaps attributed to strain effects, but actually this electrodynamic effects were sort of not really um, addressed in that, so it could be interesting to look to see if there's any actual effects in these strontium titanate thin films. And with that, I'll thank you, and I'm going to try this QR code thing, so if that doesn't scan correctly, let me know. <laughs> Thanks. So generally, in these ferroelectrics, we we'll make them thin. There is also uncompensated charges that, uh, that accumulate on each side. Is that something that we have thought about? We need you. No. And, and, and in a sense, what, the way people get rid of this is they short. They they short. The, yeah. So in order to get rid of that, maybe we need to make me we you need to make a cavity that short it, and maybe yeah. that would be an important. Um, yeah. I haven't thought about that. I would just say um, this was actually not ferroelectric. This was still in the paraelectric phase. Of course. So there wouldn't be no... Except that this thing is fluctuating, there's charges moving. There's charge the fluctuations, right. yes. Uh, you, yeah, it would be good to think about that. So just to, you, have, you have a full-blown uh, cavity, like 3D, multi-mode, etc. Uh, what went into the optimization of having the best cavity? Meaning that we can have the, like dielectrics, metal, etc. Um, so, do you, you have like any? Simplicity. No, no. Meaning that do you have some intuition how I can mold the, the modes of the phonons, photons that are? Um, I have a little bit of intuition, but we have not really systematically studied. I would say like this metallic mirror scenario. At, this is an ideal metal. So the that reason I'm asking is that if it's just the surface, then you can just put one surface. You don't need to be Possibly yes. Um, it, that, that would be something to think about, and you should be able to do this and see something there, because it's not necessarily about the resonances. It's in this case, it's actually sort of the near field change in density of states. So that should be one cavity. Um, that you could also say, well, if it's a not ideal metal, but it has a finite plasma frequency, you're not necessarily suppressing the modes completely. You may enhance them if you actually activate the surface plasmon, and so. It, there's a lot to be thought about. If it's a vacuum interface, I don't know if it's uh, yeah, so. Cool. Okay, thanks. One more question there, and meanwhile, let's uh, transition the program to the next question. Hi, John. I'm 
asking questions for kids. So he's wondering uh, whether this very strong damping of the soft load at very low temperature would spoil the Q factor of the cavity, and that would do some weird things. Uh, I'm not sure. You're basically asking about like lossiness due to this like dissipation of the soft mode, right? Because the soft mode is also very damp at low temperature. You have to. You have to. So our analysis didn't include this. We could include it because the Matsubara formalism allows for inclusion of dissipation. Um, so we could think about that. I don't know what would happen. Let's thank Don again.